ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. In the year 1825, in early colonial Sydney, a woman named Sarah Cox was engaged to be married to an officer, a Captain Payne. Sarah was said to have been quite pretty, but she could offer no dowry. Nonetheless, Captain Payne said he didn't mind. And then his affections seemed to cool. And then she discovered that her fiancé had become engaged to another woman, a wealthy widow. Sarah felt humiliated and heartbroken and betrayed. So what could this poor woman do? Well, she could weep in a corner for months on end and then just try to get on with her life. Or she could take him to court, sue him for breach of promise and extract an eye-wateringly large sum of money from the CAD, the perfectly named Captain Payne. This is just one story in Alicia Simmons' hugely entertaining new book, a book that mines a rich seam that runs right through Australian history. This is a hidden history of love, heartbreak and revenge. Alicia Simmons is an author and a legal academic who's taken a deep dive into the stories behind Australia's breach of promise action, a law that no longer exists, but which for a long time offered someone legal remedies for the emotional and reputational and financial damages inflicted by an unfulfilled promise of marriage. And in the archives, Alicia found a trove of love letters presented as evidence in court which still blaze with all the passionate love and fury of years gone by. Alicia's book is called Courting. Good day to you, Mum. Hail, fellow. Well (laughs) met (laughs) to you, Richard. (laughs) Tell me what drew you into this whole idea to begin with, these stories of breach of promise. There's two stories. The story that I tell academics, which is true, is that I was interested in writing a sort of prehistory of family law. So I wanted to know how all of these actions in the 19th century regulating intimacy came to coalesce in the 20th century in what we now term family law. And I was going to call it matching, hatching and dispatching. (laughs) And so I started researching it and I got to matching. I fell down the rabbit hole of breach of promise of marriage and emerged eight years later with a very fat book. Um, So so you had to go into the archives for this. What were the archives like to go into? Oh, amazing. I mean, it's the joy of of being a historian, really. First, you go to the newspapers, of course. And back in the day when when I started researching it, it's all on microfilm. It's not like it is today with Trove. So you find your your case from that. And then for me, I travel out to Penrith, kind of on the outer of the outer suburbs. It's really sort of a, a savannah land and you've got this huge shed in the middle of that which houses, it's called the State Records Office, which houses all the kind of papery relics of, of court actions and things like that. It's a, it is an Arcadia of silence. There's a sort of hush, you know, over it, interrupted every now and then by people uh, having their eureka moments, you know, so every now and then you'll hear someone going, oh my God, you know, this is extraordinary. And then they'll call over the archivist and we'll all have a look. And so they're, they're lovely places. I went out there with this first case just to bring up the judgment papers. And so the very first time I went, I was like, great, I'll be able to find out the bills of cost. I'll be able to get the summonses, the writs, you know, all the usual kind of probably to what a lot of other people think of as as quite boring. Anyway, so I called up this first case and, in fact, the very first one that I looked at was was Cox and Payne. So 1825, the very first action that was brought before a jury in Australia, it arrives, the, the archivist sort of brings it over and you've got a cushion there to make sure that it's all well looked after, I guess, and comfortable, <laughs> the, the, the papers. It arrives wrapped in, in pink ribbon. All of the, the papers are affixed with these rusted pins. So you have the feeling often at the archives that you might be the very first person since 1825, you know, to open these. And out fell exactly what I'd imagined, the bills of costs, you know, the summons. And then, entirely unexpected to me, were all of the love letters that Captain Payne had written to her and all of the love letters that she'd written in response. So 
I just remember being quite stunned and it's interesting the kind of emotional reactions that you have in the archives and I and I don't know why but I find myself teary at these moments. I kind of think, oh, how could these howling, most tender, most intimate things that were written with no no notion of a court case end up stapled to the cold, anaesthetised language of law. Like, what's it doing there? And is it also a bit kind of strange to be suddenly intimate with a complete stranger like that? Oh, yes. From long ago, a long dead complete stranger? Absolutely. And you do, you feel like you're communing, you know, with them. You can hear their voices, you know. But they're most raw and emotional too. It's not not like a kind of pleasant conversation. It's not pleasant correspondence. This is like, you've betrayed me. Absolutely. I love you deeply and I must see you and I can't bear what you've done. Absolutely. I uh, will have my revenge. It's almost like opening up a page of a novel suddenly to, to, to the emotional high point. Tell me, give me a bit of the history on this. How far back does sure. this breach of promise of marriage action go? It's an interesting action. So it goes back to the 5th century. The 5th fact. century? Yes, medieval uh, times. So it was an action that existed in the ecclesiastical courts, the church courts, where you could sue and men would sue in equal numbers to women in the medieval period. You could sue someone who had uh, promised you marriage and jilted you. Um, and what was the remedy for that? And the remedy for that is what uh, lawyers term specific performance, which basically means that they would demand that, that the person marry you. Oh, they right. would so you enforce could, marriage. You could force someone into <laughs> yes. marriage from you know, if you could prove that there'd been a promise made. Exactly, exactly. And, and so when it entered common law in, yep. some, in the 1700s, yep. how did it change? So basically common law judges can't force marriage. You know, you have to be within the spiritual or ecclesiastical jurisdiction to be, able, to be able to do that. So lawyers are pretty clever and they start suing under what's a mixture of contract and tort. So basically it changes in that contract says, all right, well, we need to have a promise of marriage that has been unjustifiably broken, which is the same as any kind of, you know, any contract. So what's the justification for breaking it? If you are unchaste, you know, if the if the woman in particular was was unchaste or of bad character, then then that would be a justification uh-huh. for breaking the, the promise. But if a woman is successful in pursuing a breach of promise uh, case through the courts, what yep. kind of remedies could she get in, in under common law then? They they got what was termed in the 19th century lacerated feelings. So you would sue for damages under the head of lacerated feelings. So you had to prove um, your loss of settlement and you had to prove that you um, that you had suffered um, Like being beaten in, up in the street, in other words. It was a similar th- idea. That, Absolutely. Right. I mean, it was, yeah, it was this idea that, that emotions matter. Um, and then on top of that, by the 20th century, you start to have special damages that you could sue for. So in that instance, they're the quantifiable, visible forms of damage. So, like, like income, you mean? Yeah, so you could sue for the, the income that you'd lost. You could sue for bodily injury. So there's a period where women start to claim that they went blind from, <laughs> you know, being <laughs> broken up with. Or, you know, and doctors started to give evidence about that. Right. Uh, you could sue for your trousseau under that. So that's basically the kind of the, the financial remedies. One of the things you point out in your book is that historically when a woman goes up against a man in a courtroom, it doesn't often go well for her, particularly in rape cases, mm. as, as mm. we know. Mm. And how likely was it a woman to win these types of breach of promise uh, cases? It's a real exception to the way that women are usually treated in uh, the common law courts and in criminal law courts as well, in that almost all the women that I look at win. In the 20th century, more women start to lose because there's this idea that, well, you can work now, you know, that you're not so reliant upon marriage as you were in the in the 19th century. But in the 19th century, a woman can't vote. Absolutely. There's only a few areas exactly. she can earn, a middle-class woman can earn an income. And so her rights are circumscribed, uh, her economic opportunities are much fewer, but she's got this great big legal tool to use if things go badly wrong with the breach of promise. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a real, it's one of the only areas I think that you can see in public life in the 19th century where women have a voice. You know, the community recognised that a woman's entire sort of economic and 
quote, social future dependent upon marriage. This is a very serious loss. In a sexed labour market where women can't earn a livable wage, really, particularly if they've got kids, then marriage matters. It also seems like a, uh, a time when courtship is, there are a lot of witnesses to courtship because it's also heavily supervised and promises are made in writing by letters that are kept by the aggrieved parties. So it's not hard for a woman to prove her case that a promise of marriage has been received if a man has said, I look forward to the day of our betrothal in, yes. in a letter. <laughs> exactly. So this, this is working in her favour. Well, let's, yeah, let's start yeah. with that case then yeah. from 1825 sure. in colonial Sydney. Sarah Cox versus <laughs> the perfectly named Captain Payne. Tell me a bit about the plaintiff, Sarah Cox. What was her story, her background, please? So Sarah Cox is a currency lass. Um, what does that mean? A currency lass means someone who's actually born, a native born um, in Australia. So she's born around 1805. Her parents are convicts. Interestingly, um, they're not married. And I say that's interesting insofar as uh, most of the people in the early colony didn't marry. In fact, if we look at the early colony of Australia, and I'm thinking sort of 1788 up until kind of the 1820s, it looks far more like our intimacies today than what we imagine the Victorian era to be. Right, but, so it, you, but it must have looked like sexual anarchy uh, sexual for the anarchy, time. Exactly. By the, by the standards of uh, the time. Australia was described in one commission report as one vast brothel. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're absolutely right. It was considered to be... Um, to be sexual anarchy. Basically, you, you're looking at people coming from the working classes in England who carry with them the custom and the tradition of cohabitation rather than marriage. It makes sense for a woman to not want to marry, you know, in this period. You marry and it's it's civil death. You lose everything. If you don't, if you just cohabit, then women keep their property. Uh, on average, I think relations li- relationships lasted for about 10 years. There's no divorce legislation at this stage. No one can divorce, but they do. You, you look at the colonial papers and they're filled with notices from people going, well, we've decided to, to part by mutual consent. Um, no longer responsible for his debts. He's not responsible for mine. You know, end of story. And this is, you know, outside of law, and yet it's sort of what's going on. So that's so, the first couple of decades in the, that's in the colony. Right. Yeah. But by, by this time, it's 1825. Yeah. And and Sarah Cox meets the Captain Payne. And what is the, the courtship seems to be quite proper by the standards of the day, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the first thing that I found out about Sarah Cox was through reading the, the newspaper reports of her, of her case. And so that basically said, you know, she was a seamstress. She was, in the words of her barrister, William Charles Wentworth, she was possessing of some attractions which um, won her the attentions of, of Captain Payne. Captain Payne had sailed up from Port Dalrymple, which at the time was um, Tasmania, and uh, he was delivering some letters to Sarah Cox's employer, Mrs Foster. And while delivering the letters, he glanced over, saw the the bewitching um, Sarah Cox, who another suitor, the suitor called Mr Suitor, um, had described her as having killing beauties. So I do think that she was probably a bit of a lass and he immediately decided that he wanted to marry her. So uh, the next day um, over breakfast he says, you know, if you don't mind I'm going to give you this letter that I want you to give to your family, you know, and I'm hoping to get your consent to marry. Just like that? Just like that. I've actually got the letter here if you'd uh, like me to read it. I would. All right. So this is it from Captain Payne. He says... My dear Sarah, he says, I beg leave to acquaint you that it is my intention to sail on Tuesday next, if possible. Therefore, I think it is my duty to inform you that my affections for you are founded on the most honourable and pure motives, which is possible for any man to be in possession of. And believe me, my dear Sarah, that I am so much interested with respect to your conduct and character that it is morally impossible for me to propose or wish you to do a single wrong act which might tend to injure you in the affection of your parents or in the eyes of the public. But, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> what, what's that about? That's like saying I have no intention of forcing myself upon you. Is that what you're saying? Basically, basically. And, and I, I have no, no desire to demand... Uh, that you enter my bed, essentially. Is that Absolutely, what that's right. it. It's also, it, it suggests something about the history of love. Did he promise in 
in writing that he wanted to marry her? Did he actually put that down? He did. He promises he married in, in writing that he wants to um, to marry her. He then follows that up with another letter saying, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely going to, you know, to do this. You have no, no um, cause to be concerned. She uh, speaks to her parents. Her parents consent. She consents. Captain Payne's a very good match. The parents at the same time say, look, we're not wealthy. But he's not bothered by that. He's not bothered by that. He's completely fine. But then his affection's cool. His affection's cool, I think, largely because Sarah's a really feisty woman and he makes the mistake of rocking up to her house drunk one night and she thinks this is very inappropriate and she says so in a in a volley of rather vituperative letters that she then regrets. So the, the regretful letters I have in the archives um, and that's the ones where she says, oh, if I've gone too far, um, you know, I'm terribly sorry, you know, I hope that you can forgive me, let's go back to being what we were. I have a feeling that he he at this point goes, well, I don't, I don't want someone so difficult, <laughs> you know. Right. And so he then disappears at that point. Um, I find out from the court case that actually he started courting another woman, um, Miss Redmond, who he then abandons in favour of the wealthy widow who he marries called Mrs Leverton. Okay, so he's he's also seeing this Mrs Leverton, the wealthy widow, yep. whom he decides that's going to be a better match for him. And when yep. he sends the letter breaking it off, with Sarah. How does she respond in writing to this awful, grievous news? Look, I think in many ways she responds to the, like, in the way that that we would probably respond to something like that. So you see in the archives these six letters that go from pleading to fury. Um, I want to hear the fury. Can I hear the fury, please? (laughs) You can hear the fury. So first she says, um, you know, I think that you'd presume that I have feelings as well as yourself. There are, therefore, I'm determined to know if your mind is altered from what you once thought of this. If this is the case, then I'd like to know, you know, as soon as possible. I trust that you will not think that I'm in a passion and hope that you will not trifle with my feelings. She doesn't get a response. So she then writes again and she says, you know, I demand my letters back. She still doesn't get a response. And so she says to him, to you, it seems that promises are like pie crust that are made to be broken. I was not first the first one to break the pie crust. You were. But the past I will forget, if possible, I hope, and that I will find someone that will reward me for all my faith. And then in another letter she says, I'm led to understand that you say you've been told that I intend in forcing you to keep your promise. Indeed, sir, I do. And so that there, these words that she'd anticipated saying on the day of her wedding, you know, are now a threat for, of legal action. Um, the final letter that she says, she just says, I'm very angry to think that you give me so much trouble in this. You are an ungrateful wretch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I will find someone who deserves me. Okay. Good on her. So she's decided to take him to court for breach of promise. Yeah. Astonishingly, her solicitor, her barrister in court, is none other than William Wentworth. This is the William Wentworth, the man who was to become the richest man in the colony of New South Wales, the man whom half of New South Wales is named after. That's the same William Wentworth? It is the same William Wentworth who um, started the Australian newspaper um, with Wardell, the same William Wentworth who went on to draft the New South Wales Constitution and the same William Charles Wentworth who I realised after um, I, I had found the case was in fact wildly attracted to Sarah Cox in the you know during the um, during the trial. So suddenly it seems Captain Payne is in a world of hurt. To use a turn of phrase, <laughs> Captain Payne is in serious trouble here, and the the court finds in favour of Sarah Cox. What kind of damages did she win against Captain Payne? So she wins £100 damages, which um, translates to about $180,000 Oh, today. that's serious money. It is serious that's money. That's very <laughs> serious money to extract from an individual. That's amazing. Yeah, it was intended to set you up for life. That was the, the it was meant to be that you would be so um, scarred, so stained, you know, by this this action that no one would want to marry you and so, um, you know, so you've got this money. An alternative reading is that actually the court is giving you a kind of dowry. So the next person goes, oh, look, I'll, I'll overlook, you know, the I, ignominy of the, yeah, of the action. Okay, so we might think the story is over at that point, but it's not because six months later 
Sarah Cox has a baby. Six months later, she has a baby, but with whom? (laughs) She does have a baby, and we know about this baby because it's written in William Charles Wentworth's bank book, Birth of Timmy. Now, if we match up the dates, it's quite clear that she is pregnant during the trial where she is successfully claiming her chastity, claiming that she is a woman of good character to none other than her barrister, William Charles Wentworth. And so she has this this child. In fact, she has two children uh, with Wentworth entirely out of, out of wedlock and they're, they're illegitimate children basically. But do they get married anyway? They do end up getting married and William Charles Wentworth, as you, as you rightly said, goes on to be possibly one of the wealthiest men in the colony, certainly one of the most powerful. Builds Vaucluse House. Vaucluse this astonishing House. Astonishing estate, yes. Beautiful, absolutely. And if you go there, you really see in the architecture what happened to Sarah and and William. So she so must be so, so she's married the wealthiest man in New South Wales now. Um but what's her life like as as living in Vaucluse House as the wife of this enormously wealthy and powerful man? So you're, you're thinking, you know, it should be kind of like Bridgerton. She should be running balls. She should be attending government house. She should be organising suitors for her, for her children. Instead, if you go to Vaucluse House to this day, there is no foyer. There's no entry. There's no place for anybody to, to be entertained when they arrived. And that's because uh, while Sarah may have won her legal action... The fact that she had two illegitimate children and I also imagine the fact that she came from convict stock meant that she lost all social rights to participate in society. So, oh, for God's sakes, in, com- know, in, in convict Sydney? Right? <laughs> Surely I mean, not. really. <laughs> were we doing that back then? Were we doing that sort of stuff back oh, then? Oh, we were terrible snobs, absolutely. And what about William Wentworth? Because wasn't he the son of a highway robber in England? He was, and this is the thing. So basically she tries to keep from her children, you know, her ignominious past and doesn't really manage to do that. But But she tries to, you know, tries to do that. Uh, and they eventually find out about the fact that she'd had these two children out of wedlock and um, illegitimately in the same way as Wentworth found out about his his father being a highway robber, um, and that is through really humiliating public debate. So Sarah ends up, and I think one of the saddest moments in her life, well, there's two. Firstly, the minute that her daughter, her first daughter, marries uh, a wealthy lawyer, he says to um, the daughter that she's never to see Sarah again. Um, she's one prohibited week- from seeing her mother absolutely by her husband because it's going to be a contamination she will be defiled simply by they called it pollution um in the 19th century so uh there's one period for about a week where she has complications with her pregnancy where um she's allowed to see her but other than that she's not and then it all ends with governor fitzroy who's terribly democratic and lovely arrives in the colony in the 1840s and invites Sarah, one of the first people actually invites Sarah to Government House Ball. And the minute that he gives her um, an invitation, word goes out around society that Sarah Cox has been invited and every single woman in the colony who had been invited retracts their invitation. Uh, Here it is, boo. Boo. God. This is so Jane Austen, all of this. It's It's very Jane Austen. Um, But you make the point that this breach of promise action and enforced here in the yep. case, very successful, even in the case of Sarah Cox, was actually a bit of social engineering on the behalf, on the mm. part of Governor Macquarie at the time. Mm. What was he trying to do with the colony of Sydney and why was he so happy to see the breach of promise uh, action enforced through the court? Um, I mean, if we go back to our conversation earlier, you have the colony moving from a penal society to a society based on free immigration. Now, in order to attract people to come to Australia, they have to get rid of their their reputation as being a one vast brothel, you know, as being this place of, of licentiousness and a den of iniquity and vice. How do they do that? Macquarie arrives. One of his first um, instructions, in fact, is... Um, or orders and proclamations is um, to encourage everyone to marry. But is that going to work? Because there were too few women, weren't there? There were very few women um, and it was, yeah, absolutely, it was difficult for for guys to to find a partner. But, you know, the thing is people are are cohabiting at that stage. What he wants is state-sanctioned marriage. And so he starts to give financial benefits to those people who do marry and have children and to take them away from those people who aren't, who are cohabiting. So, 
for instance, in the penal colony, you could, you know, get inheritance rights even when you weren't married. This is crazy. You know, nowhere else in the in the world could you do this at the time. You had to marry in order to have inheritance rights. And yet the courts are constantly giving this out, partly because, you know, none of the judges in the early colony were, were legally trained, at least until 1810. So they're sort of sitting there going, oh, well, you know, I'm read in classics and yes this seems this seems fair enough I'll give you some some property so that changes and and it's a successful campaign what they're trying to do you're right to call it social engineering they're trying to channel this unruly emotion that we call love into socially appropriate forms and marriage is seen as the moral foundation of the social order by the 1870s 77% of the population are married This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. The next case I want to talk to you about, Alicia, is the case of Stewart versus Burns. And this begins with a woman called Ellen Stewart, who's in Bathurst, New South Wales, at the time. Now, tell me a bit about the kind of woman Ellen Stewart was. She'd been a governess. Was she an unusually polished figure by the standards of colonial Australia for the 1850s? Yeah, without a doubt. Ellen Jane Marion Murray Stewart, she ended up calling herself, was what I think people in the 19th century would term distressed gentility. So she was a governess, as you say, um, and governesses, as we can see from literature, could be two types. You could be Jane Eyre, hardworking, you know, born to kind of poor or tradesman, you know, stock, working your way up, or you could you could be someone wealthy who's lost their money. Particularly in the 1840s in England, there's banking crashes. The Victorians were, were obsessed with governesses because they were such liminal kind of figures. They were seen as, as difficult in that on the one hand, they had all the manners and polish that you would expect of middle-class women. They were, yeah, they were educated, but they were also paid like any kind of tradesperson would be or any working-class person would be. So to that extent, working-class people didn't see them as working-class. They were far too polished. Uh, similarly, middle-class people were worried that they were the conduit through which working-class sexuality and vice was entering the middle-class home. <laughs> How did we know whether their manners were actually just learnt? Did we know that their manners actually meant that they had the same morals as us? Who were they? You know, and there's a series of novels in the 19th century called things like The Masked Interloper. These ideas that the governess was was actually going into the middle class home to sap your coffers, particularly in Australia where you're talking about, uh, you know, in the 19th century, Pasts were very shallow. You know, no one really knew who anybody else was. This is a place where, particularly in this uh, in this period, 1857, they're in Bathurst. You've got the the gold fields just just around the corner. So she's an educated woman, yeah. and she's a woman of some polish. Nonetheless, yeah. she's a governess, yeah. and she's working in in Bathurst. And she yeah. meets this gentleman, Mr. Henry Burns. Yeah. And they become betrothed yep. to one another. It's a very respectable courtship, so it would seem. Tell me about the night that this courtship comes unstuck when Henry Burns flies over from his residence in Orange to Bathurst with a letter in his hand. Henry Burns is living in Orange. She's living in Bathurst. She's with Mrs Wise. Mrs Wise is the wife of Chief Justice Wise. Okay, so she's she's in the home of what at the time was called a provincial government house. She's in the big house. They meet there. They have the usual courtship. They go horse riding together. They exchange letters, although clearly he's far more interested in her than she is with him. Henry Burns knows that he's got competition in that house, a man called Charlie Wise. And I've seen a photo of Charlie Wise and he's a dashing man, lovely, thick, luxurious moustache, thick head of black hair, and uh, and they... 
meet and clearly Ellen is a little bit more attracted to to Charlie Wise than she is to Henry. Nonetheless, she knows what side her, her bread is buttered on. She agrees to the engagement with Henry when he proposes. He goes to Orange and Mrs Wise has a ball. She has a huge ball because it's um, a Cizé week. So all the judges and all the, the, the lawyers are in town. Charlie and um, Ellen make a bit of a spectacle of themselves. How did they do that? Well, I think that Mrs. Wise's letter that she writes to to Henry Burns is the best is the best description of precisely what goes on. So she says, "Strictly private and confidential, and keep this, my dear Mr. Burns. It grieves me very much to be obliged to write to you as I must do. Before your engagement, I had doubts. This from the best of motives. I struggled against them, confessing them only to yourself, and I may may say to herself, herself meaning Ellen. In spite of this plain speaking, I saw her permit the same intimacies and the same familiarity which I had so much blamed before with Charles. All of Sunday afternoon was passed together in the manner of Saturday evening, the evening on which you left could not be mistaken by anyone who witnessed it. We have had parties each evening since, and I too found that ill was before me, that there was intimacy, there was romping, dancing with Charles Wise, enough for the whole room to remark, and other conduct convinced me at once that she was deceiving both you and me. She, I must say, as well as her mother, They so completely threw off the mask they must have been wearing that I saw all at once that their deception was at an end, that the daughter had been playing a part and she will continue to play her part. And miserable as it is for you to be awakened to these facts, it is better that you should be awakened now than find yourself married to one who has deceived you. I must urge you to weigh my words well and bear in mind I have never deceived you and I have your interest in my heart as if you were my own brother. So Ellen's been spotted flirting essentially with someone else. Romping. She's been romping. (laughs) What on earth that means we can only guess is probably smiling and laughing at his jokes, I suspect, (laughs) uh, under the circumstances. Uh, uh, Nothing worse seems to have been alleged there. Nonetheless, this is seen as well far beyond the pale and the mother is implicated. So her her mother's around at this this time as well. So Henry Henry's got this letter and he rides over and uh, straight away uh, to Ellen and presents her with this letter. What's her response when she sees this poison letter that Mrs Wise, her employer, has written about her bad-mouthing her like this? Well, interestingly, Ellen, rather than saying, oh, look, you know, bursting into tears, going, don't worry, none of this is true, says to him, if you believe this, then I will take you to court for breach of promise of marriage and I'm going to sue her as well. The mother, who's also there in this scene, intervenes and says, oh, you know, Ellen, enough, you know. Look at Henry Burns. He's over here. He's being honourable. Like, let's, you know, let's talk about this. And so, of course, they do. They they sit down in the chair and, and he says, all right, well, look, I'll go to see Mrs Wise tomorrow. I'll find out what's going on. Um, and don't worry, you know, we'll still get married. And that's the last she hears from her fiancé. So she's going to take him to court. Now, what actions is she going to pursue through the courts as a result of this letter? So there are two actions, and you can imagine Bathurst at this time. Not much happens. So these actions are the talk of the town. And they are defamation is the first one. So she claims that um, Mrs Wise has Mrs. defamed Wise her, has defamed her right. resulting in the loss of her marriage, and she sues for breach of promise of marriage. In the 19th century, no middle class person would get involved in this kind of a in this kind of a dispute. So none of the witnesses who they call, um, you know, from government house actually appear. So it just ends up being Henry Burns um, and his father versus you know Ellen Stewart and her mother, and then you know similarly with the Wises. So so, so Ellen here, yeah, she's 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 taken strong action, but she's hanging on to dear life to her respectability here. So this is she's got everything to gain and nothing to lose by pursuing this through the courts. So you went looking into the background of this governess, this Ellen Stewart Murray, as she was, and it turns out Ellen wasn't her birth name. No. You know, if you were to read the actual um, court transcript, she says, well, you know, I was um, born to John Oliphant Murray. He was the British attaché in Paris on the Rue saint Honore." born to very kind of illustrious stock. Um, And yet when I looked into it, I found that actually the mother 
claims that that they had had an unhappy marriage and so she strikes off on her own as a governess um, and she leaves John Oliphant Murray. But she did say that they married, um, you know, in a church in Paris. What I found when I looked in the births, deaths, marriages um, register in England is the fact that they there's no proof at all that they had married. Oh. And under Ellen Stewart Murray, you have, in fact, just the name Ellen Stewart. Um, you have her mother's name and then in the father's name there's a dash and it says allege. Uh, illegitimate? Meaning illegitimate. Oh. So what happens after the case? Because it's very easy for her to prove the breach of promise of marriage. You know, he has clearly, there's a lot of um, love letters there where he says, I'm going to, you know, to marry, marry you, I'm you. engaged. Mm. It was That was a cut and dry action. He appealed it after the case saying, look, I was justified in doing that because I had found out something about her, but this justifies what what I had done and he refuses to pay the damages. And it was when looking at the births, deaths, marriages uh, register that I went, oh, of course, she's illegitimate and, in fact, her mother... Why would such a, a wealthy person who's, you know, dated the British attaché or whatever end up in Bathurst? You know, you're concealing, uh, you're concealing a sordid past, at least, you know, as it's, as it's known in the 19th so, century. So this is why you go on to say that this is kind of proof that women of the gentry in colonial Australia took on the role of asserting class distinctions. This seems like a horrible and cruel way of going about your business, the business of enforced respectability. Absolutely. And as much as you move, you have to recognise that people are moving with you. Um, and so how does Charlie, you know, how does uh, Henry Burns end up finding that out? Because all of her mother's friends from the mother was actually originally from a slaveholding family in Jamaica, moved with her. So the Forbeses actually come from Chief Justice Forbes. He comes from Jamaica. Um, there's a lot of movement from the former slave colonies to Australia and weirdly to Bathurst. So she thinks that she's getting to Australia to, to escape this past and that no one will know. Unfortunately, the past travels with her um, and she ends up with this community who go, I know exactly, you know, the the story of your of your daughter. And they close the doors against them at the moment where it looks like the daughter might enter their ranks through oh. marriage. So she's taken Henry to court and this Mrs Wise to court. She wins the case, of course, for breach of promise because it's all there in black and white. How did Henry's reputation come off after during the court case? Was 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 he someone ex, somewhat exposed by this court case? To be honest, I'm not certain that uh, that it affected Henry that much. I mean, it's you know, it's never great for a middle class person to be to have their dirty laundry aired you know in public but he went on to marry and and that was fine ellen uh i think what the case also shows is just how dependent middle class women were on marriage and she ends up marrying um, almost immediately after the case to the original grantee of a very small town around there called rockley uh, watson augustus steel um, and to this day, when you go to Bathurst, there's lots of monuments to what, what's an Augustus steel. And none, of course, to, to Ellen, in spite of the fact that, you know, I, I think her history is so interesting. I, I, you show that her mother, Julia, had come from the West Indies and she too, it seems, was born as an, quote unquote, illegitimate child. The feeling was you'd come to Australia and reinvent yourself, but people in the British Empire are circulating. There are people there from the West Indies who remembered her family. Maybe you can't escape your past when you come to Australia. These are the most mobile people in history. You know, the 19th century is a great age of mobility and migration. So on the one hand, you could, and, you know, we do have uh, in Australian history just so many um, swindlers, in fact, so many fraudsters who put on lovely jewels and or, you know, one man who Kirsten McKenzie has written about goes around in these lovely red clothes and lots of jewels and um, and claims to everyone that he's the heir of the Lassels, you know, estate. Oh, it yeah. turns out he's no one. I've got time for one more case here. This is a case from 1920. This is the case Daniels versus Culverhouse. And the plaintiff, Daisy, was a vaudeville dancer. Now, you found a picture of her in a newspaper from 1918. How does she come across in the picture and in the interview that you found? 
I mean, I love this case because she's such a modern woman, isn't she? So in the in the newspaper where I found her being interviewed, um, she's there with a blonde flappers bob, blooming cheeks, a kind of coquettish smile, endearingly crooked teeth, um, and she's dressed in furs and sequins. And at this stage, she's a very famous vaudeville dancer and a pantomime dancer. And not just in Australia, really. Well, look, if you were to believe the article, she says that she's born to a priest. Her father was a priest in in Suffolk. Um, Her mother raised children. And then she runs away from home and joins um, some dancers in London. She then goes, she meets her first husband um, while dancing. He's a female impersonator. Um, She has a child. Her mother looks after the child when she goes back to work. Um, And at this point, her career really takes off. And there's a lot of, you know, posters that you can see for her still um, around this time. So this is kind of just before the war. And she goes across to the Moulin Rouge. She dances over there. She's a hit. So that's true. It's true. She was a hit in Paris. So that's all true. What was not true, I found out, was that her father, yes, was a priest, but actually a charlatan priest. A he fake was priest. A fake priest <laughs> who was discovered because he was always reluctant to marry people <laughs> because he knew that the, the second he was going to be um, exposed that none of the marriages would, would be binding. Okay. Um, so she's got this career. She's yeah. she's well-known. She's a genuine success. She's yeah. hailed in London and in Paris. Yeah. How does she meet her soon-to-be fiancé, or so she says, Sydney Culverhouse? So at this stage, she's um, she's dancing under the name of Daisy Yates rather than um, Ellen Mangay Ellis, which is her actual name. She's dancing in the Moulin Rouge. She goes back to her hotel um, one day and there sitting in the restaurant is this very dapper-looking man um, called Sidney Culverhouse. She goes over. She says in her court case, oh, it's the habit of, you know, theatre people and dancers and whatever to invite each other up to their rooms. You know, they are, they are far more sort of sexually licentious, I think. Than, okay, than so they've got a sexual stage. relationship pretty quickly. I think it's yes. pretty clear that they do. So they decide that they're going to start dancing together, pretending to be a brother and sister duo. Wow. Called Sydney and Daisy Yates. He's going to pretend to be her brother on stage, but behind the scenes they ha- they're having an affair. They're having they're having not even just an affair. I would say they're they're really quite in love, and um, there's certainly talk of marriage. I think that the the decision to to cast themselves as a, as a brother and sister duo works against her in that it means that he's then got a license in public to go off philandering, you know, and flirting with with whoever he wants because they want to pretend that they're just a, a brother and a sister. Whatever would my sister think of this? <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Oh dear. Exactly. So so then war break. World War One breaks out. They go to South Africa and then they arrive in Australia and they're a huge hit in, in in Australia. How did the relationship then falter between Sydney and Daisy? They'd been dancing, you know, all around Australia. She's employed with the JC Williamson Company and part of her employment contract said that she's only ever to be contracted to dance with Sydney. Okay, so that was that was crucial to it. JC Williamson has JC Williamson himself has uh, a cousin called Maggie Dickinson, and she's on the rise. And he decides to to pair Sydney Yates with Maggie in a war pantomime or war ballet. And where's Daisy while all this is going on? Well, Daisy's got no role in this. You know, it should be Daisy who should be, who was meant to be, you know, paired with him, not Maggie. So she's furious. She's lost work um, and suddenly Maggie's swooped in and I've seen pictures of Maggie and she's very cute. Um, so I can kind of see that, you know, what was, what was going to happen. So then in August 1918, she receives a letter mm. from Sydney, the man she thinks is going to, she's going to marry. Her, her dance partner. How did he break the news to her? Can you read that letter, please? Absolutely. So this is sent to Daisy while she's in Sydney. He's been off with, with Maggie all around Australia. Then she gets a letter, August 1918, and he says, I feel I must make my confession to you at last. I bottled it up for a long time. The fact is I am madly and hopelessly in love with Maggie. Don't think I'm trying to hurt you by confessing this, but I should feel such a cad when we meet if you did not know. I shall still be the same thoughtful boy to you and have your interest at heart, both financially and otherwise, but I'm sorry I cannot be the same old Sid. It had to come, Daisy, sooner or later, and here it is. Please take this letter in the spirit it is written and at least give me credit for being honourable. See, I think this is a pretty good letter. But I'm a man, aren't I? I'm a man. 
<laughs> and I think that's you got to break. You know, he's he's having an affair with someone else, and he's breaking it off with her, and he's being pretty upfront about it. And he's being, you can never write a good letter like this. That's going to be really nice. That's <laughs> that's going to make the aggrieved party feel that it, that everything's fine. Or have I got this completely wrong? What, I I, what, what am I not seeing here? No, Alicia? I mean he also refers to himself as a rotter in another letter, and I I beg to differ. I think he's a rotter. I also think he's been terribly self-aggrandizing. You know, there he is. He's meant to to be in love with uh, Daisy. They've definitely, um, I think he's, I believe her when she says that he's, you know, proposed to her and that they're engaged to marry. And then he says, actually, I'm having this affair. I'm really in love with Maggie. But by the way, this is, uh, you know, at least give me credit for being honourable. Now, you know, judging by breach of promise cases, you cannot, there's nothing honourable about doing something like this. A man of honour should have kept his word. Well, that's what makes the case interesting, I think, is that by the time it goes to court, she's absolutely picked up her her career again. Um, she's not economically reliant upon him. Her case, I think, is interesting because she doesn't, she's not claiming that she's lost anything economically. She hasn't. But how is it um, affecting her emotionally, though? It's all about emotions, Richard, exactly. It's all about her suffering. Um, and I loved this case because part of what I realised when you look at breach of promise cases is that we have a history of heartbreak, um, which I'd never really thought about before. Um, so in the 19th century, um, you know, women would, there's a lot of sambulism when, they, when they're when they jilted. You know, they... Sambulism, sleepwalking. A lot of sleepwalking. A lot of sisters going, oh, yeah, she's taken sleepwalking again. It's terrible. She shrieks down the hallway. None of us can sleep. Disastrous. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> you know. Sleepwalking with heartache and shrieking down the end of the corridor. That's a common 19th century mm. um, response, dissolving into tears, agoraphobia, taking to your bed. That's, that's generally what happens in the 19th century. But yeah. also in court, they don't have to prove it. It's assumed that you suffer. By the 20th century, it's no longer assumed women start to describe more precisely how they're suffering. And with Daisy, what I found interesting is that she encapsulates this shift from the 19th to the 20th century where they go from from being these somnambulists and these shriekers and, and wailers to medicalising, you know, their, their heartbreak. So she says, oh, I was in ill health. I was hysterical. I was crazy with grief. I suffered shock. You know, that's, that's part of it as well. And are you seeing a connection there to the men who came back from World War I with what was then called shell shock? Exactly. It's the beginning of that. So if you think about the, the beginnings of psychology, it obtains its legitimacy post-World War I because of its success in treating shell shock. And with that comes a new language that filters out to the public about how to describe emotional harm. So women take this language of shock and of shell shock, of nervous shock, of neurasthenia, and they start to bring along their doctors to court and say that they are suffering from heartbreak. What are the symptoms of heartbreak? Nervous shock, neurasthenia, I've lost my eye, I'm paralysed in my legs, all of these psychosomatic forms of harm. And the doctors usually say she needs about three to six months off work, um, you know, to recover from heartbreak. If you go to the asylum records, which I decided to do as well because I was sort of thinking, is this just happening in court or is this elsewhere? So, you know, so I went to these asylum records and you start to see um, around this time as well women going into asylums, suffering, the cause of injury is, is is, um, or illness well, is seen as heartbreak. Well, I, I don't know about somnambulism, but I think it's certainly true, and I don't think all of us have had that thing where we've felt it or seen it in other people who've suffered some awful breakup. They look terrible. Sure. They're physically afflicted sure, by sure. by heartbreak. It does seem to happen, doesn't it? I agree, and I think it's it made me go, are we living in callous times? Why do we now just exhort people towards, you know, to, to resilience? Like that's the language now. Oh, well, dust yourself off, get back out there. Join Hinge, forty five dollars a month. You know, not bad. Like you should be, you should be okay. But and then it's taking strange. it to the, but then taking it to the courts is a whole other thing to see. <laughs> but then I suppose was the thinking again that inflicting the kind of psychological and from that perhaps even physical distress that comes from a painful breakup is a bit like getting beaten up in the street or, or, or not. I don't know. I think that they they certainly, including in psychological literature, they compare 
what soldiers suffer to heartbreak. So Freud and Brewer actually make that very explicit. They say, you know, you're going to see the same kind of psychosomatic injuries uh, that a soldier will feel from shell shock, uh, you know, in in women who have suffered heartbreak. And not just women, men also at this at this point start to claim that they can't marry because of their neurasthenia. They start to claim, you know, so... So men are taking women to court for breach of promise here as well? Men start to take women to court far more in the 20th century for breach of promise, but this is actually the men who are being taken to court. So you'll have one side going, I couldn't marry because I, I suffer from nervous shock as a result of the war. And then the women in turn will say, well, you jilting me has given me nervous shock. Um, you know, so everyone suddenly has these kind of these psychological injuries. It's it's almost like... Oh, that's completely fascinating. <laughs> that's amazing. That's, really that, that's extraordinary. So, so how did she go in court? How did the case proceed? She did win. The jury were very much on her side. But She's a star at this point. And, and I don't think that there was any way that, that she couldn't. But also she had up her sleeve this trump card, which is where she claimed that um, Sid had venereal disease. And that was why he couldn't marry her. And if you think about this period around the time of the war, everyone's obsessed with venereal disease, with with the problems of male sexuality. Oh, and they've brought and it home Sid from just the, looks like an from, exemplar, right? And they've brought it home from the brothels of France exactly, while they've been over there. And, exactly. And this is a, my God, so he's been ex- exposed in the courts as as um, someone with an STD. Oh dear, dear, this is pretty <laughs> amazing stuff. Was there much public interest in this? Oh, every newspaper in the country, and that's the other thing, Richard. It's any of these cases, you would always end up with the love letters written out in full in the newspaper. So you'd pick up the Sydney Morning Herald and there would be a huge two-page spread that would have all of your love letters in it, all of the court testimony. So if you jump on Trove, for instance, which is a digital newspaper archive um, or database for this, uh, there's hundreds of cases for this. Every single person in Australia is reading about Sid being a rotter with venereal disease. I'm going to end this Jane Austen style like we started. My dear Alicia, it has been most enlightening and edifying enjoying your (laughs) most excellent conversation. (laughs) I can only give you a thousand thanks. Indeed, it was most proper. Thank you, Richard. Alicia Simmons' book is called Courting. I'm Richard Feidler. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.